this video is the last part of the series. If you are new to this channel, you might want to watch my older videos. After my last BGA desoldering attempt, Felix shared me a few more tips. So I bought some PCB holders specially designed for PS3 motherboards. I also tried to replicate the same setup as Felix. I covered the edge of the preheater with aluminum foil to prevent heat from escaping there. Then I also cover up the motherboard with another layer of aluminum foil. This creates an enclosed space to heat up the motherboard efficiently. Again, instead of jumping right into the motherboard I want to work on, I try it on another motherboard with a 14 nanometer RSX processor. Just like usual, I pre-bake it in an oven for about 12 hours before I put it on my preheater. This time, the motherboard temperature is quite close to the preheater temperature compared to my previous attempts. When the board reaches 160 degrees Celsius, I turned on the hot air station. According to my previous experience, the BGA solder joints melts at around 250 degrees Celsius. But I'm curious if this new setup changes anything. So I nudge the RSX processor from time to time. It seems the solder joints won't melt below 250 degrees Celsius. After about 17 minutes, the temperature is very close to 250. So I get myself ready to remove the RSX processor. At around 20 minutes in, the processor is removed. I wait for the motherboard to cool down completely and then remove it from the holder that I just bought. Then I inspect the solder joints to see if there are any missing pads. Feel free to leave a comment below on what you think. But to me, it seems I have successfully desoldered my first RSX processor. Thank you, everyone, for the suggestions. It wouldn't have been possible without your help. Oh, wait. It's just a test run. It's not even the motherboard I want to work on. Anyhow, let's summarize what we have learned in this attempt. First, putting aluminum foil along the edge of the preheater helps a lot. It allows the motherboard to reach a higher temperature without setting the preheater too high. Second, the RSX processor always comes off at about 250 to 260 degrees Celsius. Finally, the whole desoldering process takes about 20 minutes, so we need to be very patient. Bear in mind that I started the desoldering process right after pre-baking, so the motherboard was already at 100 degrees at the very beginning. If you start from a cold motherboard, it will probably take longer than 20 minutes. Now, it's time to try on console number 3. I noticed there's a sticker on the top left corner of the motherboard. It has been probably fixed by Sony before. I was expecting to find an official Frankenstein mod done by Sony. After removing the IHS, it's just the usual disappointing 90 nanometer processor. If you know what this sticker means, let me know in the comment section below. Since this is the motherboard that I really care about, I put extra effort to cover up all the plastic components to prevent them from melting during the desoldering process. As usual, apply some flux and then pull it inside the oven as the preparation step. I've mentioned in my last video, I modified the timer a little bit so this oven can bake longer than the original maximum one hour. The nice thing about having a large oven is that you can bake two boards at the same time. I set the oven temperature to around 100 degrees Celsius so that it's hot enough to boil the moisture away but not hot enough to damage the board. After pre-baking, I confidently proceed to the desoldering. I'm so excited about having my first Frankenstein mod. As the temperature approaches 250 degrees Celsius, I realize something. I don't have the tool for reboiling. I've been so focused on how to get the desoldering right, I totally forgot about there are still a few more steps to solder the 40 nanometer RSX processor back to the motherboard. So I changed my plan at the very last minute. I decided to go for a reflow rather than desoldering. I really hope simply reflowing the processor can solve the problem. Unfortunately, it's not. It becomes green light of death instead. Assuming my reflow was successful, the problem seems to be in the underfill. So doing an RSX swap is the only way to fix this console. Anyhow, if we check the status of the four backward compatible PS3 at this point, all of them have a green light. So I proceed to reflow console number one, hoping that I can turn it from green light of death into fully working. 
When I was working on console number one, I can't stop blaming myself for how stupid I was, not buying all the equipment for a complete BGA rework. As I blame myself for my own stupidity, I tend to be even more stupid. My brain was not working, and I was probably thinking about pressing the RSX down so that it makes a better contact with the solder joints. Obviously, it doesn't work like this. I ingeniously turned a green light of death console into yellow light of death. I proceeded to check the syscon errors, because it is the most reliable tool to understand the cause of the yellow light of death. And I see this new number that I've never seen it before. I immediately messaged the authority figure of the PS3 community, Felix, already anticipating a facepalm from him when he hears the full story. So when describing the situation to him, I'm being a little bit evasive. He quickly replies suspecting a shot in the shoulder joints. Hmm, I really wonder what causes it. He also suggests me to check the resistance value near the RSX processor. So I follow the discussion of this post and use my multimeter to check the values. Something is obviously wrong because the values are unusually low. Here's my readings compared to the suggested values. After this, I check the syscon errors again and I get another new number. I look it up and it seems something super complicated. Well, I'm sure the future me will handle this. Now let's move on to the console with the video output artifact. This is console number 4 that I discussed in my last video. I really hope a reflow works for this console. Now I look back to my footage, it doesn't even reach the correct reflow temperature. So it is definitely not a successful reflow, and I didn't expect too much from it. Somehow after the reflow, I don't have the video artifacts anymore. I won't say it's fixed, because I think it's just barely working. Nonetheless, at least it's good enough for me to install custom firmware. After the installation, I found that this console has been only used for 25 days. Anyhow, I quickly extract the data from this console and send it back to Nagato to rebuild the PlayStation Home surface. PlayStation Home is basically the metaverse everyone is talking about these days. But Sony did it 20 years ago, way before this concept becomes popular. I highly recommend you to check it out. Alright, it is nearly the end of this video. I appreciate everyone who watches my video. At the very beginning, I simply used YouTube as a cloud storage for my own reference, so I didn't expect any views or even subscribers to my channel. That's why when I finally get views and subs, I was really really surprised. Once again, thanks for the support, especially people who always give me tips in the comment sections. Finally, I need to apologize that I rushed a little bit in my last few attempts, because I was also preparing to move to a new place while trying this BJ rework. My new home is much smaller than my previous one, so I'm not sure if I can still do the same BJ rework setup here. Anyhow, I will try my best. Happy New Year and see you next time.